Now we are going to have a panel discussion on women in force, leadership, representation, and evolution. In this panel discussion, uh, the discussion is going to be around gender diversity, the women role models, the importance of women in leadership, the challenges faced by women in the industry, and for that, we have like a esteemed speakers who are going to talk about that. So joining us today will be a panel of amazing women who are an inspiration to people worldwide. We have Vintia Shanmukham, Director of Engineering at Mintra, joining us today. We also have Priyanka Nahata, Architect at Flipkart. We have Dr. Preeti Saryan, Chief Scientist at Soft Circuits. We also have Bhavna Prabhakaran, who is an avid force contributor, joining as the moderator for this panel. We invite all the guests to uh, join, you know, to come on stage so that we can have a, we can ha set the vision on how we can build an inclusive and gender diverse community. Please give a huge round of applause for our women in the leaderships. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion on women in force. My name is Bhavna. Uh, I'm currently working as an engineer for Unravel Data and I'm also an open source contributor to Apache Airflow. Today for the discussion, we have Vindya Shanmuham, Director of Engineering from Mintra, Priyanka, Architect at Flipkart, and we have Preeti Sharyan, Chief Scientist at Soft Circuits. So I will start uh, with a very important question. What is FOSS to you, to all the panel uh, members? Uh, see, when we enter this uh, conference, we have seen a board where FOSS is like uh, democracy, freedom, Assad. That was written in the board. So for me, FOSS is an empowerment because uh, I took a career break after my maternity leave. So after my maternity leave, I joined back work and due to heavy burnout uh, during the peak COVID, so I had to drop out of the work. So for almost 1.5 years, I was contributing to open source project. So open source project is like an empowerment to me. It gave me the freedom to go and see whatever part of the code that I can go and check. I can work on any part of the code. So that is the kind of empowerment that I got from the FOSS. So I want to ask to you all, what is FOSS to you, starting with Vindya? OK. So um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Vindya Shanmugam. I've been in the industry over 20 plus years now. I work as a director of engineering at Mintra. Um, I work in storefront. Um, I manage some of the critical systems uh, like search relevance, search experience, personalization, your shopping cart, wish list, and the entire payment ecosystem. So, um, so really, really excited to be here. First of all, very vibrant community, and uh, definitely for you know from my perspective, very very important. Like if you see um, in Mintra, uh, we democratize fashion in the country. So similarly, FOSS is about democratizing technology. And I feel each and every organization should have the commitment to, and it should be part of your strategy and your roadmap uh, to make sure we are contributing. And also, that will help you know, foster innovation as well. So there should be a strong commitment from you know, all the organizations. Hi, I'm Priyanka, and uh, I'm working at Flipkart uh, with the designation of an architect. So I am currently looking at the charters of conversational commerce, the Gen AI, and the LLMs. So when I look at that, that what is FOSS, what it means for us, I think it is an absolute, absolute need. It is through FOSS that we can have a reach which we cannot have if there is something not free and open source available. It is a way to, in my opinion, would be to amass community intelligence, which I am a firm believer that, you know, a community intelligence is way more than any personal intelligence can take you. So, and I personally believe that, you know, to force to add to any contributions, it is not just putting some code commits. Any act of using a force, advocating a force, being part of communities like this, being part of discussions, online discussions, everything adds to it. So in my opinion, it is an ever-growing community, and it needs to be strong for us to basically progress. Hi, uh, I'm Preeti. I work as a chief scientist at Soft Circuit. And I have spent 
13 years in academia and I never heard of FOSS. <laughs> so uh, then you know what the FOSS condition is in academia, right? Uh, but we use FOSS very, very heavily because most our labs, we can't afford money. Uh, we don't have enough funding. And, uh, but then we need softwares for analysis, for uh, imaging or whatever. And uh, we keep looking out for open source softwares that we can use and which are very good. Uh, so yeah, so I think when my husband started working as a volunteer for FOSS, that's when I got to know that there's something called FOSS. So I don't have much opinion as such what FOSS to me is, but at the same time now I'm building it up uh, what my viewpoint is towards FOSS and I think I, uh, Academia has a lot of uh, scope to contribute towards FOSS and uh, uh, need more awareness. Uh, because as a student, I didn't know what FOSS is. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll start with some questions. Um, so when I started earlier in the career, I was very ambitious and I want to do many things. But slowly as I progressed and the years rolled, I had more additional duties. I became, uh, I was married, I got a children. So I had to uh, become a low time worker and a high time caregiver. It, ha it is how my career progressed. So what is your take on this? And can I also share something that will help women to thrive in the uh, irrespective of all these uh, caregiving work? Yeah. So, um, so making like, uh, you know, these, um, you mentioned conscious career choices, right? So first of all, uh, it's important to you know understand uh, what are the factors influencing these conscious career choices, right? So fundamentally, if you see, um, you know, it's a cultural mindset. So how we have seen, say, our parents, we have seen our grandparents in our homes. Um, you know, typically we've already bought into the idea of what the responsibilities of a man and woman is, right? So we clearly, you know, we want to, uh, you know, we just add to that responsibility. So I know as a woman, I have a strong opinion that I have to take care of my family, right? When you talked about conscious career choices. So another factor is also like about, um, you know, uh, money also plays a role. So in a family, you know, husband and wife both work to work. So typically what I've seen is, uh, you know, husband maybe earns slightly higher. So the woman always tries to sacrifice. He wants to let him run and, you know, faster. So in the best interest of the family. So there are these factors definitely which influence. But my uh, thought process is like, uh, say, if you're saying conscious, if as long as it is conscious, definitely you will have different phases in your journey you're making a conscious choice and you want to go slow during this phase, I feel that is still fine. And it is better than not knowing what you're signing up for, you know, and you're getting into, you know, you're demotivated and, you know, you're facing a lot of failures. And finally, you might even give up. Okay, this is not working for me. So that awareness itself, I think, will help you out in, you know, traversing this phase then not knowing it at all. So that, that would be my take. As long as it's a conscious choice, you are aware of the situation, and you know that this phase, this is how you want to navigate. So that's my perspective. But uh, you know, any other comments on that? Sure, I can add. Uh, so how I look at it is that uh, money, or probably what everybody talks, is just the tip of the iceberg. Yes, of course, if two people are working in a family, you get a little more better financially or you might get that thing. But I believe that that's the tip, what is seen and what is talked. And you have a whole lot of uh, iceberg below it. What you gain out of working is the exposure, is the um, ability to probably handle more situations in a different way. And it's not just that the work helps you in work. It helps you in your personal life as well. So when you are making that conscious choice, being aware that all of this also helps is important. 
to bring out that this thing it is not just about money it's not just about this but take that conscious call talk to people talk to reach out to women folk whom you know talk to people like us through communities to understand that in that journey how important it is at least to try try out see if it works for you make that conscious choice than just taking a choice because we have known it in a particular way so that is all so to all this i would like to uh, give one more perspective uh, i think making conscious career choices also have to be combined with the communication with the family right like having a because once you get married have children so you do need to you uh, communicate it to your partner what your uh, aspirations are what you want what you where do you see yourself right because today's uh, time and how uh, the society is growing so we know that you know as women we don't want to sit back right we we also want to be best in our field so how do we do it if you also have to be a good caregiver right so by uh, sharing responsibilities and that's how the volunteering system works as well right so husbands a husband and wife they both have to discuss communicate to each other and have priorities set like women can have like two or three priorities men also have to have more than one priority work cannot be just one priority and that would also help ma uh, women make these uh, conscious career choices and also thrive in their career choices without burning out yeah thank you thank you so i have next question to priyanka um, can you tell about the role models for you because when i started contributing to open source i'll just go and check the list of other contributors is there any women here and even when i started earlier in the career whenever there is a important meeting at office i get entered into the room check is there any women here like we go and lean towards the peers so that we can see it is like uh, standing in the bottom of the mountain and looking up at the peak is there anybody who is like me so that i also can climb up in the mountain so is, uh, do you have any role models for you at work and if s yes, can you tell me how actually they shaped the helped you in growing in your career i think i can uh, identify a lot with you i i am architect at flipkart it is an ic community and it is heavily skewed uh with male population so yes during my course of time i also went ahead looking for you know do i see a fem familiar uh gender whom should i talk to and all that but over the course of time i think uh my company has given me a great environment and uh, i've realized that there are two kinds of role models that you have role models like you know ceo of some place or a leader or something and there are more aspirational north star ones but in my opinion what really shapes your career are your everyday role models and uh, i will i will not take any uh, shame or embarrassment in saying that uh, while working at flipkart i've had numerous role models and i think i've not looked at it from a gender perspective i have had mostly uh males who have been guiding me mentoring me and of course uh i would come across some females also but i've only realized that as long as you are able to identify with anything that should be a good cue for you to move forward when i joined the ic community i did not there was no female ic at flipkart i could have very well taken a decision to not join it but what my mentors put me through is that you don't look at this part you look at what your capability is what your likes and dislikes is you look at your contributions and everything and if you find even one thing that matches it need not be gender or it need not be ethnicity or anything of this thing but anything matches please go ahead take that chance what is the worst that can happen it may not work out for you you can always take that switch but do not bias it at only on some features which are probably you know just given to us bias it more on the features on capabilities likes and dislikes that you develop so i have had lot of role models at flipkart and uh, i learn every day and i also feel that you know you don't have one role model 
There are somebody I look up to for communication. There are somebody I look up for for mother tech, technology acumen. There are somebody I look up for effective communication. So I think it is the amalgamation that you see what you like and what you want to improve on, and then you take it forward. Yeah, uh, just to add on to that uh, point, what Priyanka said. So one thing she mentioned about is uh, like having this uber aspirational role models. But uh, when I see my teams, how I construct my teams, it's also important, as she mentioned, having day-to-day -day role models. So for a developer, she's seeing a tech lead, how she's orchestrating, how, how she's navigating. For a tech lead, it could be your manager or a senior manager or a director, right? So it's important any minority communities will have their own challenges uh, that you're facing. And uh, it's definitely important to address those. And having those everyday role models definitely helps them and learn from their experience because everyone will be in their own phases of life. And you know, women's journey is you know totally different, right? They learn from their experiences, right? Right, so I'll just add some twist to this question. So, because we have a lot of experience, so many people may approach you with questions on as, as, as their role models. Like, what are the common pattern do you see with the young uh, women or young people coming into the industry, and what are the fear that they have, uh, or uh, what are the questions that you are commonly f uh, faced up with with young people coming into the industry? I think I get a lot of questions. Uh, they're not really nice questions, but it's more like you know, I'm scared because I see no other girl or female into this. Can I really do it? So I find it very depressing, but I also understand that you know at some point I was also there. And that is when I realized that mentor and guidance is required. So I will only say one thing that there is no skill I have come across uh, which is inbuilt in you. I completely and uh, thoroughly believe that a skill is built. You only have that interest to take it forward. Like I, I have recently joined swimming classes. And there is so much chatter in my head when I go there. I am the eldest one, kids are swimming, all of this. So, but I also see, even if you talk to the best of swimmers, they will tell you that, you know, it's not that they did it on the first day. It had to be built. So I think this notion, if I am able to impart to somebody, which I try being a mentor or a guide, that you take any skill, as long as you're willing to work for it, you're willing to give time, you will be in a place which will be way, way higher than average. You'll be amongst the good. It just requires these two. I don't think being a particular gender or ethnicity stops you from taking a particular. It is the fear. It is the notions, the cultural notions like Vindya said and all that. So I, I uh, put in a lot of time for mentorship because I personally feel that it can really help people take that bump. And when I say mentorship, it's not just women. I do come across, you know, guys approaching that, uh, will I ever be this good? So I think it is there in all. It's just that somebody helping you take that bump is always good. And I'll just repeat again, because I firmly believe that no skill is born with you. You don't have any particular skills. It's not based on ethnicity or gender or any other thing. You build a skill. You give it time, you work, and you build a skill. That's nice. So I have the next question to Preeti. So could you tell some uh, feasible uh, ideas to increase the representation of women in STEM, especially in leadership roles? Um. I have this question specifically for you because you are a chief scientist and you have worked on many open source culture, not only open source software, but also open source hardware and open biology. So you will have a more broader outlook for this question. OK, thanks. Um, so to increase, uh, like uh, how it is in other, uh, I think, engineering departments as well. So even in uh, academia, as you progress forward towards higher education, the number of uh, women keeps on decreasing. And, uh, and then, you know, you would uh, then move forward, they will become faculties, and then you will get on different uh, uh, panels for uh, decision-making panels, right? And as you keep moving higher up, the number of women representation keep on decreasing. 
And I think that uh, one way to get it uh, better is, uh, or like make it better, is probably by uh, women having more uh, confidence in what uh, they are doing. And that can be done by having more participation in asking questions and any discussions that are going on. Because in academia, unless and until you ask a question, you go and talk to people about their work, you cannot get anywhere. Right? You can sit and read as much as you want, but then when you discuss your problem with someone, like you know, you will find solutions really, really fast. And you have to talk interdisciplinary because the solutions are like can be anywhere, right? So uh, that is one thing. And uh, also is um, uh, to uh, get there. Like whenever you get an opportunity, just take it. It need not be at uh, your workplace, like uh, let's say in PhD. It need not be that you you are guiding like you know ten students or something. But it can also be something as simple like you know your hobby class, right? So uh, let's say you go for learning dance or music or anywhere. So if you are made a group leader or like you play sports, you uh, are a team captain, right? So these are also the kind of activities that give you a taste of what leadership is like. You know, because you have to handle a team. And uh, you start from where you're comfortable. If academia is not where you're comfortable, then you start from somewhere where you're very comfortable. And then slowly you keep building on this, and then you start moving this uh, in other directions, like in uh, start bringing it in your career. Because that moving towards leadership quality, it has to be more conscious. So I guess, you know, if yeah, we make conscious like how we make conscious career choices. Same way if we make more uh, conscious leadership choices where you want to be, what kind of qualities, like you know, you pay attention to those details and move forward, then we can see more women in uh, STEM. Okay. So that gave me the clue to the next question, which I'm going to ask to Vindya about making a effective communication because uh, uh, the uh, like Preeti told, we have to ask many questions. So when I first joined in the tech industry, I was very hesitant to ask any questions because I was afraid that I will sound dumb. So I didn't ask many questions. But after a few years, when I started asking questions, uh, it was assumed in a wrong way. Say example, with a group of people, they are explaining some architectural diagram, and I'm pointing out something is wrong in this diagram, there is case where people tend to take it personally. Like it is as though attacking themselves and not the, uh, they think that the argument is over the people and not on the architectural or design diagram or the code. So that is one of the important soft skills where I struggled a lot when I started. So if you could shed some light on making some effective communication, it would be helpful. Hello. Talking about uh, like effective communication, right? Uh, so I've been part of a lot of uh, women-led forums, and we have a very strong, uh, you know, we for she community in Mintra. So the problem that I hear, you know, the most, even before going to effective communication, is being able to speak up, you know, be in the meetings, discussions. So this has happened to me as well, right? So we judge ourselves, right? And in a meeting or any conversations, you are validating your thoughts and your, what you want, your thought process. And being unable to communicate, that itself is a big problem. I think majority of the women face it. Both men and women face it, but I think women majorly. They are very uh, hesitant to express themselves, be open about their opinion, uh, they worry like, okay, people are going to judge you or people are going to form perception of you or it could be as simple as, you know, uh, you might be wrong, this is not the right thing or this is not the right answer. So uh, I think the first step is to just speak up, right? That is the first step. It's okay to be right, it's okay to be wrong. Um, you know, you need to express your opinion and people need to know about you, how you're thinking, um, in uh, you know any kind of a professional setup, so I, I feel that is the problem. And effective communication, I would say, it's applicable to both men and women. I've seen that uh, you know uh, there will be egos, there will be clashes, 
um, you know, people will be opinionated in your design, your architecture, or whatever in those discussions and conversations, right? Um, so that, I will say, we'll build on top of it slowly. We build with feedback. We build with we correcting. And also, another major aspect of that is you need to network also, right, within your colleagues, uh, having a good, managing a good relationship with them, earning their trust, also plays a big role uh, in influencing, you know, what you want to, uh, what design you're proposing or influencing those decisions. I think those also play a big part. You have any points to add on this question about effective communication? I think uh, effective communication is much more holistic. It doesn't start with, say, I'm on stage and I'm talking. Uh, however good an orator I may be, however good a speaker I may be, this is not effective communication only. Effective communication is me able to impart what I want to say to you. And that cannot just happen in one lecture. It's like we all see. Just reading a book is not enough to gain that knowledge. A good teacher with a book does wonders. Similarly, effective communication, like Vindya said, you know, it's, it's a mix of all. You develop those uh, relationships so that, you know, you can explain at a much more informal level, formal level. You can reach out. You can probably correct yourself in an informal level. You talk to multiple people. These all the constant feedbacks that you get because you develop these relationships. You are okay to talk to, reach out to anybody and talk. This is what eventually shapes effective communication. It is not something that, you know, take in a class, give out three lectures. It is going to make you confident, which is a very big component for doing anything. But if you really want it to be effective, then you have to take into account who you are talking to. Communication is not just about I talk like this, I will explain like this, and this is what I do. You have to look at who the audience is. That is why it is a 360 degree. I have to tune how I reach to you. What is the best way I can reach? And I think that is, that's what, why you require a constant feedback. And what's the best way to give you constant feedback? If it's all formal, I have to explicitly come and ask to you feedback. I'll probably do once a month, once in three months, that's all. Versus if I know you and I can just informally come and chat, I can have that loop so quick. I can improve on that. So I think while these things look separate, networking looks separate, this looks separate, they're all interconnected. That you know, you do one, you will see yourself improving in others. So for me, effective communication, I look at it as a definition, am I able to convey my thoughts in a way that my audience can take it? That is how I look at it. So it's not one-sided, it is from both sides, multiple factors. I think both of them have covered very well about what effective communication is like. So uh, I want to just add a few things from like more coming from an academia perspective. So that is like uh, how we improve this effective communication. So probably uh, like you said networking, right? So uh, when I was in college, like it helped me a lot having different groups where uh, in one group, if I'm a novice, right? So I can ask questions and uh, people are always willing to help to uh, make you understand what the topic is, right? And uh, and then in some other group, I am uh, also an expert. So people ask me questions and then I'm answering. So this kind of balances both things out that I'm able to effectively ask a question because I cannot ask a question which is like 10 sentence long, right? I should also learn how to make my questions short, how to make my answers uh, short or more effective and like very well you said that you know it's not just about knowing what you're going to say but it also is about orienting your answer to your uh, audience so so yeah that's uh, one other way like having different groups can um, to talk to can help you uh, make your communication more effective yeah thank you thank you so next question I have to Priyanka uh, can you share about the project or work that you have done, but it has failed miserably? Like, how do you deal with a failure at that time? Um, I think I've been part of a lot of projects which have been failure. Uh, starting from school, college, everywhere, I can say, 
that uh, and i think uh, i have changed a lot over the years how i take failures uh, i will tell something recent i i told that i am part of the ic community but this was not the chosen career i had taken i had actually moved to management leg i was part of it for about 6 to 8 months and it's not that i was not doing good but what i realized that it was still a failure for me because i was not feeling at my place every day i was kind of dragging my feet or i would be like yeah, yeah i know how to handle this that's not how i'm learning so and it was very difficult for me to go up to my senior and say that you know i've made a wrong choice and i've been living with that choice for 6 months and i want to switch now there was a lot of apprehension that you know what will all of them think you don't even know what you want are you dumb or anything of the sort and moreover now if you go you know you will be lagging behind in the ic community do you really want to miss that edge whatever time you have spent can't you just mold yourself in the same thing so i think uh, that was a huge thing for me deciding and i i will not say that uh, you know i was absolutely best at handling or anything there was a lot of chatter i went through a lot of learning but i'll say that what this failure has taught me is that eventually i met nobody i have met nobody who's not seen a failure be it a project they worked absolutely with full belief be it a career choice be it a personal choice a relationship choice everybody has seen failures and everybody will however good you are however bad you are i think what has helped me is that realizing that because everybody has to see failure at some point or the other in this i am not going to fret over why i failed or this but i'm going to see it as okay i failed what to do next what is the cost it can take and this so at least for my career i am really happy that i did let go of my earlier choice and move to the ic i know what i lost i had to go over those apprehensions but i will still say that looking back i feel that i am happy i faced that rather than you know probably molding myself into something i was not liking so failure is what you regard inside at that point if somebody asked me i would say it is a failure i could not do what i chose but today when i look back i feel that yeah fine but where i am i am happy i am thriving and i am happy that i took that bump took that apprehension away and actually faced my failure rather than just accepting or hiding behind it do you have any points to add on on this failure part uh, so i think she brought out uh, the important part even um, so everybody has faced some failures or the other so um, see uh, 10 years back uh, when i think about it something that did not work um, at that moment i would have deeply felt okay this is not working this is the worst thing to happen in my life right and you moved on and um, say now when i look back uh, i look at it at a totally different perspective so i think that is the best thing that has happened to me because it changed the way i'm thinking it changed the way my thought processes and what i am today right so now i am in agreement with myself um you know to treat both success and failures equally because i feel that uh you know while success we are all glorified and we are so happy about it at the moment but how important it is also to experience the failure how we are dealing with those failures so those experiences make us a totally different person and in the long run i feel it's more uh, you know benefiting than the other one right so but that realization is important to treat both of them as equals and uh, you know and navigating with the hope and belief that uh, yes eventually things are going to change right so that that is very important that mindset is very important yes pretty you want to add on this, this point because in academia failure is a different case because as a research person you would have that would be like a part of your daily work mm -hmm. so how do you deal with that failure in your case uh in my case i generally prefer instant gratification with uh, some of my hobbies <laughs> 
So because research is a very long thing and I, when I started my PhD, I did not know how many years it will take, five, six, seven, like eight years is the maximum that they allow in the institute. So yeah, eight years was the maximum time, but I didn't know how much more, or like whether I'll finish in five, six or seven years. Uh, so, and uh, my research was again plants based in the forest, so I can do experiments only once in a year. Now, uh, if I, come back and uh, analyze my data, and then I feel like, oh, this thing hasn't worked, and I have to like redo it, I have to wait for the next year, right? So then how do you deal with that kind of stress? Because you, you spend one entire year, and now you are at a place where you don't have any data, because whatever you, experiments you did, everything is failed. So uh, in those kind of scenarios, like having uh, things which I did uh, for instant gratification helped me a lot, like sports, and having hobbies of knitting or something, you know, like where I can see things grow faster. So that has helped me a lot in uh, dealing with the stress. So I would like, uh, I've always taken Sundays off irrespective of uh, how uh, heavy the work is. And those Sundays I've used only for you doing these instant gratification sort of things so that I know that, oh, I started this work, I have finished it. I've started this work, I've finished it. So it gives a kind of confidence that, okay, you started your PhD, you will finish it. You started this project, you will finish it. Maybe not this year, next year you can definitely do it. So that's how I have coped with the failures. That's or I nice. I should say, like, you know, how move forward. I will also share one of my failure stories in FOSS. So that just came up on top of my mind. So when I was contributing to uh, Apache Airflow, um, I have worked on a specific uh, issue. And after working for almost five days, I realized that there is a one-line code change that I could have done that would have fixed this issue. But I actually spent some five days to come to that realization. So I was very upset that day. Like, why do I have to waste five whole days for one line code change? And uh, instead of that one line change, I have written a whole different file, and now I have to uh, delete all those code. So it was very uh, tough for me. So the actual project that I, I was uh, working on itself is a rewriting of the old uh, script files. So uh, I told to my mentor, sorry, I wasted some five days of my time on this. And my mentor told me that you don't have to worry about throwing out the code. So you know, uh, what is the best code? You know, it is the code that is not written. So you don't have to worry. Code, code is a debt. So if you write less code, it is actually a very happy thing to do. So you don't worry about throwing out your code. And you know, what is the project that you're actually working? You're rewriting all the code that I have rewritten. I, I have written. So you are actually changing all the code. So I should actually worry more if, if, I'm, if I were you. So that kind of, re that, that uh, wisdom that he shared at that time gave me kind of realization. OK, so if not for that five days of time, I wouldn't have arrived at that one line of code. That is because of the hard work that I put on the five days. So I, I, that moment gave me a different realization that I have to view a failure in a different perspective. Uh, so with that, I will ask the next question uh, to Preeti about setting the work boundaries. So uh, one of the reasons when, when I have to quit out of my work is due to a very heavy burnout. Uh, because uh, during the COVID time, many companies were adopting to work from home at that time. And uh, in, uh, as a part of my job, I had to sit long for meetings. So it took at least three to four hours of my work time, in which my contribution would be around like 15 minutes. All the other three and a half hours, I wouldn't even mind listening, but I have to, I will be just sitting in the meeting. So it, ha it, it actually had a very adverse effect on my health. Like, um, so I, that is one of the reasons that I felt is the main reason for my burnout. So uh, when you are doing the work, there are uh, times where you have to sit in unnecessary meetings or you have to, um, um, you have to, like, people may uh, occupy your calendar in times, like, at the evening times or at odd hours at night. Uh, it is okay if you to go for some uh, occasional release releases or if there is some very big deployment coming. But if you have to do this on repeatedly, then it is a kind of violation of our personal life. Because for, uh, 
earlier when I started the career, time is a very available, sparse resource. I can use it. But when slowly I started to move ahead with family, with kid, time is one of the very uh, uh, expensive resources that I have. So how do you filter out those noises and establish a work boundary and find space and to do your work? Can you tell about it? Yeah. Uh, so uh, finding work boundaries, first of all, I need to know what my boundaries are like right like what time what i'm doing and uh, like for example if i have to feed the baby have to put the baby to sleep then there are certain slots which are not available at all and communicating that to your team is must you know and uh, in today's time at least like all the people i have ever worked with uh, people have always been understanding of uh, what your concerns are and especially after covid like, you know, because the work from home has become so important and everybody is going through that, that some, everyone has some or the other event that they need to, like, compulsorily attend or they have some time fixed for uh, other activities, right? So uh, people are quite understanding. So communicating that to your team that these are the slots which I'm not available at all becomes very important. That's the first thing. And uh, the second is, uh, the, sorry, the first thing is knowing it for yourself, what your boundaries are, that's important. Then second is to communicating it to your team that uh, these times I'm not available. And then comes, uh, let's say, you know, you're working on a project, it requires you to have more time than what is required. Then you have to talk to your partner that, you know, I need more time. Then you figure out a time that how you can, you have a discussion and then you make uh, time available for those extra meetings and uh, like what you mentioned that you had to sit through like some very unnecessary meetings uh, luckily my supervisor had been very understanding so even if we had lab meetings and then you know like because I was graduated but at the same time I had some projects that I had to be part of so my supervisor has always said oh look you know this is where your part ends you want to attend it you attend it you don't want to attend it you can leave Right. So, and also we uh, had uh, lab minutes sort of thing. So somebody is making note of what all is discussed in the lab meeting. Uh, so it comes, I think, uh, the person who is the team leader or the person who is organizing the team, they also have to make this conscious effort of telling people that if you know your part is done, then you can leave. Uh, but please go through these meeting minutes. So have something meeting minutes so that people don't feel left out. Right. Because at the end, if I'm leaving the meeting, I feel like, you know, what if they're discussing about something that, you know, I really wanted to know, right? So, so that way, then you know that, oh, this is what they discussed. And if it was something that uh, was interesting to me, I can actually go and talk to those people that, oh, you guys discussed this, what was that about? So that would probably also help. Yeah. You have one. So yes. uh, just, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, Preeti brought in a right point, like setting right expectations, both in your workplace and at home also. At home also, you need to set that expectation with the family members to delegate stuff. And uh, one thing, uh, one mistake that I did, say, always I wanted to be the super wom uh, woman, right? Um, who has like a list of 10 priorities. And I always think that, okay, I can do it all. Be it home, be it children, be it, you know, I want to check all these boxes, right? Be it work. So uh, I think that is, I realized that that's a wrong thing to do. Uh, always now, if you see my priority list, it's like just top one or two priorities. That's all I want to focus on. And the rest of the clutter, we need to get rid of ourselves. So it's always everybody operates in this 24-hour time slot. Everybody has 24 hours. And where we invest our time, what is important to us, that we need to have the clarity and, you know, focus on the those top two priorities that would, uh, you know, help us. Priyanka, you have points to add on this work boundaries? I think it is a lot how both of them have covered that prioritization and then communication of uh, what are your boundaries is the most important thing. And uh, yes, the world is a lot more considerate post-COVID, so I think uh, we should be leverage it. We should yes. leverage it as much as possible. So, yeah. Yes. So after having a burnout, quitting my job, and joining into the force, 
so it was when I understand understood more about setting up the boundaries, understanding why it is important to have a healthy boundary and create some space to work. Uh, because in in force there is no formal meeting. People don't meet. They all the communication happen only in the written form. So that itself is a kind of a big uh, realization for me. Because see, the people don't meet or huddle, but still they make a good quality code and they are doing a periodical release of that code in the open source. So it, is, it doesn't mean that you have to be always available, but still having a proper communication, having, a, uh, having it in written form and accessible to everyone, and um, making the, uh, doing your code contribution in your own free time would help you uh, bring out such good quality code is what I learned after the FOSS. So I have a last question, which is uh, a question to all of you. See, imagine you are meeting your own younger self, because we have been in the work for almost uh, 10 plus years now, so you are meeting your own younger self. What would be one advice that you would give to your own younger self? So for me, it, is, it would be like uh, uh, taking enough rest for my body and for my mind is a very important uh, productive uh, way of uh, living because uh, earlier I was thinking that uh, if I'm not working for a long time it is a uh, I'm being unproductive but actually it's a very big myth I realized very later so uh, if I meet my younger self I would tell give enough rest to your body and mind and you will get best output afterwards so could you also share about what you would advise you would give to your own younger self I can start probably. I think I will say to my younger self that uh, do not strive for perfection. Uh, just go ahead, put yourself out, try a few things. You will fail, but uh, as, a, as a person from the future, I can tell you that as long as you are trying, you will be in a place that you will be happy about it. I don't know. I mean, if I meet my younger self, I will probably tell them to keep uh, a good support system. I mean, I, I think, uh, and not let go of all the side projects that you do, because all the side projects that you do can also help you in many other things and also, you know, can also open up career choices for you later on. So don't close the doors. Just, you know, like whatever you're doing, keep doing and uh, keep that support system where you can talk to. Yeah, so myself, I think I called out two things. <clears throat> one is setting the right priorities, and the second one is um, embracing failures. Failures, okay. <laughs> so those two, I think um, that's something that I would say my younger self to correct it, because I used to be stressed out on these things. Okay. Now something that I learned along the journey, and you know, kind of corrected it and realized it. Cool. So I'm, we are ending the panel discussion with this. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone.